welcome to the New England Air Museum. Uh, we're here at 35 Perimeter Road in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, right down the street from the new control tower. My name is Ken Roskin. I'm one of the 150 volunteers that work here, or I should say volunteer here. Um, and we have three hangars, which we'll be walking through. We have a military hangar, a civilian hangar, and a B-29 hangar. Uh, we'll be going through all these, picking out uh, interesting airplanes for you to look at, and hopefully you'll come down and uh, take a look at everything we've got here. Uh, we are open uh, seven days a week from 10 to 5. Here we are in our military hangar. Uh, everything in here is uh, military origin. To my right, we have the Bill Bell Iroquois helicopter, uh, nicknamed the Huey, made famous uh, in the Vietnam uh, conflict and also flown by Sylvester Stallone in all his Rambo movies. Uh, this is a utility helicopter. Ours here is set up with guns and rockets. It could also be used for medevac uh, and troop carriers. To my right here, we have a Fokker triplane, uh, World War I. Uh, this was made famous by Manfred von Richthofen, uh, nicknamed the Red Baron, uh, not to be confused with Snoopy or Red Baron Pizza. Uh, this is loaned to us uh, by the Rhinebeck Airdrome, which actually flies the planes like these during the summertime. Here we have a Hiller Raven uh, OH helicopter. OH stood for observation. Uh, the size of the bubble made it very good for observation. Uh, this is a little bit later than the MASH helicopters that you've seen on TV. It's gasoline powered. Uh, interesting feature with this helicopter is the pilot sat in the middle and he would have a passenger to his left and his right. Here we have an F-100 uh, nicknamed the Super Saber. Uh, it was a Cold War era fighter uh, used extensively in Vietnam for ground support. Uh, as you can see it's made out of aluminum, unpainted, uh, primarily for weight. Uh, if you look at the back end it looks a little bit discolored but that's not discolored aluminum, that's titanium. The aircraft had an afterburner, and if the back end were made out of aluminum, it just would have melted away. We are in the center of our military hangar. Uh, to my right, you can see uh, a command counter-rotating helicopter. He went about it a little bit differently. Rather than using a single rotor blade, he went to duels, intermeshing. Uh, which took away the need for a tail rotor. Uh, he's located right down in Bloomfield, Connecticut. Behind me, we have an F-14 Tomcat, uh, Navy fighter, uh, swept wing, supersonic. Uh, this was made famous by Tom Cruise in his, one of his early movies, Top Gun. Working our way around, the silver and yellow, uh, that is a PT which stood for primary trainer. Uh, before the pilots were turned loose into the uh, high-performance fighters, they had to learn on one of these. Uh, they were painted yellow. Uh, they were called the Yellow Perils because other pilots stayed away because it was a pilot that was learning and they never knew which way he was going to turn. Then working our way around, uh, the silver and yellow jet is a Sabre jet, F-86, uh, made famous in the Korean conflict. Then working up, we have a Grumman Hellcat, naval fighter. As you can see, the wings fold up for, uh, for space on the aircraft carrier. Next to that, we have our Connecticut aircraft, uh, the F-4 Vought Corsair. Uh, we call it the Connecticut aircraft. It is Everything on this aircraft was made here in Connecticut. The engine, the airframe, the propeller. So it was all Connecticut on that one. A very good fighter from the World War II era. Now this green, uh, it's a B-25 Mitchell. Uh, here again, these were made famous by uh, Jimmy Doolittle and his raid over Tokyo. This is a later model. Uh, rather than having a glass nose uh, for the bombardier, they put in 450 caliber machine guns. And right next to them, they also decided to put in a 75 millimeter cannon. It uh, was used for ground attack. Uh, it did quite well in the Pacific Theater. We have a 1942 Jeep. Uh, contrary to uh, popular opinion, um, these, this one was made by Ford. 
uh, not Willis. Uh, the reason behind that was one manufacturer could not make enough and keep up with the uh, the demand for uh, product in World War II. So uh, other other manufacturers built them under license. Behind me, uh, we've got a P-47 Thunderbolt. Uh, this was the first all-metal fighter of World War II. Uh, this came on a little later in the war. Uh, was used uh, very well in ground support, uh, strafing, uh, bombing, uh, a very rugged, strong plane. Uh, it could exceed 400 miles an hour. Uh, it could sustain a lot of damage. Many of these guys got a little carried away at treetop level and uh, came back to base with uh, pieces of trees stuffed in the wings. And they kept right on flying. Here we are in the hallway that uh, leads from our military hangar to our civilian hangar. Uh, we have many engines on display here. Uh, early engines going back to 1917 and at the far end all the way up to the, uh, the first jet engines at the end of World War II. We are in front of our flight simulator. Uh, this is open every Sunday from 12.30 to 4.30. Uh, the kids can get in this. It's hydraulically controlled. Uh, so when they pull the yoke back, uh, the nose goes up. Uh, they can turn left, right, go up and down. Uh, and they also get a certificate stating that they're a pilot after they've flown this. This is also open on our open cockpit days, which occur uh, one Sunday a month through the winter and early spring. Uh, where we open up uh, multiple aircraft so the people can get in and work the flight controls just like they're flying the aircraft or helicopter. Uh, to my right here hanging, we've got some experimental aircraft. Uh, the blue tail that you see there is the back end of a Sikorsky helicopter. Uh, here we have uh, three helicopters. Uh, the one in the foreground uh, is a Sikorsky helicopter. Uh, here the pilot sat uh, singly up front and then the passengers behind him. On the other side we have a Sikorsky helicopter that was sold to a gentleman by the name of Doman who was in the process of making his own specialized rotor heads and helicopters. And behind that is one of the first uh, Doman helicopters, uh, all Doman. He's a gentleman that lives here in Connecticut and comes in to visit us quite regularly. To my left here, we have a Stinson 10, uh, this blue and red uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, this was used in World War II uh, by the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, these guys would help the military by going out looking for German submarines. Uh, they would take this small single engine aircraft 200 miles out to sea uh, with uh, limited radio and uh, not much for navigation besides seat of the pants. So I give them a lot of credit. Uh, I personally don't like to fly over water with only one engine. Here we are in our civilian hangar. Uh, we're overlooking the uh, VS-44 flying boat. This was made by Vought and Sikorsky. Uh, Sikorsky, besides making helicopters, also made flying boats and amphibians. Uh, this was used uh, for transatlantic crossing. Uh, back then we needed a big plane to get across the Atlantic or Pacific. Uh, we had no big runways, but we had a lot of oceans and rivers, so they made flying boats. Uh, underneath that tail, uh, we've got a biplane. Uh, this was made by a 17-year-old uh, boy in his barn. Uh, he'd gone to a couple of flying shows, uh, made some notes, uh, came home and built one. Uh, the first one crashed. Uh, he finished this, which was the second one, and decided not to fly it, uh, so it has ended up here. Uh, swinging to the left, uh, we have a nice cream-colored aircraft. Uh, that is a Waco. Uh, this is a 1935 Waco. Uh, still has gorgeous lines even today. Uh, this aircraft was uh, donated to us about a year and a half ago. was flown in. Uh, they took the fence down, uh, down the street from Bradley Field, and we pulled it up the road, uh, moved several aircraft out and around, and pushed this one in. Swinging to the left of that, uh, we go to the nose of our DC-3. Uh, this is one of the aircraft which is open on uh, 
the open cockpit uh, Sundays. Uh, kids and parents as well can climb into the uh, flight deck as well as the passenger seats. Uh, these aircraft uh, in many countries are still flying today uh, and they date back to the mid-30s. Here we have uh, two Sikorsky uh, Coast Guard helicopters. Uh, the one on the left might look familiar from the old movies where you'd see the helicopter picking up the uh, uh, the astronauts from the early space flights. Uh, helicopters just like this would go out from the aircraft carrier, pick up the astronaut and the capsule and bring it back to the carrier. Uh, the one on the left, uh, if you notice, had a clamshell opening. That's where a gigantic radial engine is. The one on the right, uh, up top, has a uh, gas turbine engine or jet engine, which is only maybe three feet long and a foot and a half around. So the one on the left is the end of an era. The one on the right is the beginning of the jet era in helicopters. Uh, here we're looking at our uh, bought Sikorsky VS-44, uh, the flying boat. Sikorsky made three of these aircraft. Uh, this is the last surviving one. Uh, this made a trip from uh, the uh, North American continent over to uh, Ireland uh, during World War II carrying dignitaries. Uh, price for a flight, I've been told, was very similar to uh, what you would pay to fly on the Concorde. Uh, these flights were 14 hours long. Uh, your average altitude was somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet. So it's not like today where you're pressurized and flying over the weather. Here you flew either under it or in it. Uh, the good thing about the 14-hour flight is it gave the stewardesses time to, to cook your meals. Uh, back then there were no microwaves, but with 14 hours you had plenty of time to cook a turkey. Here we have a Sikorsky. Uh, it's an S-39. Uh, many people thought Sikorsky just built helicopters, but as you can see, we've got multiple Sikorsky aircraft here. Uh, this one's an amphibian. Uh, it could land on water or put the wheels down and land on land. Uh, interesting feature with this aircraft is being that it uh, spent time in the water, there are no doors on the side to get in and out, because uh, if it's in the water, you couldn't open the door with the water pressure. So if you see on top of the fuselage, uh, there's a hatch from front to rear. So it would climb up on top, open the hatch, and pop in. Uh, the pilots had a nickname for this aircraft. They called it the Jungle Gym because of all the struts on it. This is a uh, Lockheed uh, Model 10A uh, used by Northwest Airlines. Also, very famous uh, woman flew this. This was Amelia Earhart's aircraft, one just like this, that she attempted to fly around the world in. Uh, her aircraft was on the assembly line, from what I understand, the same time this one was, because the serial numbers are only two or three numbers apart. Her aircraft had slightly bigger engines and, of course, more fuel rather than passenger seats in the back. Behind me, we have a uh, U.S. Navy blimp car. Uh, might be hard to recognize uh, without the gas bag over it. So this was underneath, a uh, 10-man crew, uh, top speed around 65, 70 miles an hour. This was used in World War II uh, as uh, convoy escorts because uh, the German submarines were running havoc with, uh, with our shipping in the North Atlantic. Took two people to fly. Uh, the pilot flew in the left seat. He'd have a wheel to his right, so he worked the elevator. Uh, the officer in the right seat had a steering wheel, and he would work the rudder. So two people to fly. Here we have a uh, GB racer. Uh, GB stood for Granville Brothers, uh, and these aircraft were built right here in the Springfield area. Uh, aircraft just like this uh, won many air races. Hi, I'm Susan Orred. I work here at the New England Air Museum. I've been a museum educator here for many years. Uh, we're standing here in Kidsport, and you can see this is a kid-sized version of an airport. And we got a lot of great things for the kids to come and check out in here. We have some touchscreen video games. 
uh, that uh, can teach kids about how airports work, how airplanes fly. Um, they're touch screen, so there's a lot of interactive uh, fun stuff going on there with some games. It's also bilingual. These are also in Spanish. So some of the uh, programs are for pre-readers down the other end of the hallway here. Some of the, uh, the older uh, age kids up to age 12 could be down this end. We have a great little spot here for a photo opportunity for a family to come, uh, and it's a lot of fun in here. At the New England Air Museum here, we host a lot of school children from the area, um, kids uh, from Massachusetts and Connecticut. And we do a lot of uh, field trips around force and motion lessons. So how airplanes fly has been worked into a good science lesson for kids. So we can talk about the forces that affect an airplane in flight. So what that day would look like is we'd bring kids around the museum so they can actually see some of these great airplanes that made history. And then we'll do a hands-on activity with them, usually with a little model airplane where they can actually explore with some of those forces. And uh, if I could tell you how many times I got uh, comments from kids that said this was the coolest field trip ever, boy, uh, that'd be hard to count. Here we are in our B-29 hangar. Uh, this is dedicated to the 58th Bomb Wing. Uh, it's a memorial. Uh, this plane has been in process of restoration for roughly the past 10 years. Uh, we're just about done. Uh, we have one of the best uh, restored B-29s in the world. Uh, everything inside is as it is the way it left the factory, right down to the roll of toilet paper on the toilet in the back. Uh, this aircraft was used in the Pacific Theater, uh, one very similar to this, where uh, was the one that dropped the uh, first atomic bomb on Japan. Uh, brought the end to the war finally. Uh, this aircraft had many firsts. Uh, it was the first pressurized bomber. You were pressurized and heated, so they flew in their short sleeve shirts. They didn't need heated suits or oxygen. Uh, to my right here is the top gun turret. Uh, these gun turrets were remote controlled. Uh, the gunner did not have to sit in the turret and swing the guns around. Uh, he sat inside nice and comfortable and had a gun sight where, uh, like playing a video game. He would point the gun sight and the gun would follow the target. In World War II, uh, the pilots loved to name and uh, decorate their aircraft. Uh, the pilot of this aircraft, uh, his name was Jack, and uh, back in the World War II era, a taxi cab, uh, the nickname for a taxi cab was Hack. So he called his aircraft Jack's Hack. Play on words, so it was Jack's Taxi Cab. Uh, their missions were roughly 14 hours long, uh, up to Japan and drop their bombs and come home again. Here we have a Stearman biplane, uh, it's called the PT-17. Uh, this PT stood again for primary trainer, so before they turned the guys loose flying the B-29s, they had to spend a lot of time in one of these learning how to fly. Uh, this was an easy aircraft to fly, uh, you only had one airspeed to remember. Uh, it took off at 60, it cruised at 60, and it landed at 60. Here we have a uh, Wright radial engine, uh, the R3350. The 3350 stood for 3,350 cubic inches. Uh, this one is very similar to the ones uh, that were used on the uh, planes that dropped the atomic bombs. A little later version of the engines that we have in our B-29. Uh, the difference is uh, this one is fuel injected, whereas the early engines on our aircraft were carbureted. <laughs> 